Welcome to MFP Live. I'm Donna Ladd, the co-founder and the editor of the Mississippi Free Press. And here with me, as always, is my co-host and co-founder, the publisher of the Mississippi Free Press, Kimberly Griffin. Hey, Kimberly. And so we're really excited tonight, uh, looking forward to a very rich conversation with two remarkable women. Um, and we're going to be talking to uh, to them in half hour segments. And so so stick around for uh, for the whole show. We have an hour show, as you guys know. So with us for the first half hour from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation is the president and CEO, Lejeune Montgomery Tabron. Welcome, Lejeune. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're really excited about. Uh, having this conversation. I, I feel like I should disclaim that I have known uh, you and our second guest, uh, Rhea, who's going to be in the second uh, half hour of the show. I was a uh, W.K. Kellogg uh, leadership fellow for Mississippi, and you guys have provided some operating support for the Mississippi Free Press. So our, our you know heartfelt appreciation for supporting our work um, and so people know that th that that is also true. So, uh, Lejeune, I think that Kimberly's going to kick it off with you tonight. But we are absolutely thrilled to have you here tonight. Great. Yeah, I am so excited to talk with you. One of the things that I think is at the top of everyone's minds in every conversation I've been talking in every meeting I've had today, there's been conversations about the Supreme Court confirmation of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, she is the first African American woman to be nominated to the court, and we've been watching that unfold over the last two days. Tell me, you did you talked about doing an opt ed um, and talking about the correlation between her, your journey, and her journey? Can you talk a little more about that? Of course, and and I have to say I have uh, tuned in as as much as I could these past few days, because this truly is history in the making. And I'm, I'm so excited uh, for what we as a nation will soon have as a outstanding Chief Justice. Uh, she is amazing. And as I watched part of the confirmation and thought about the fact that she will be the first African-American woman. Um, I thought about myself and I did see alignment in our journey. Uh, and actually I think Cory Booker said it best. His closing arguments yesterday told a story of many African-American women who have treaded pathways to become the first uh, through their experience, through their achievements, their com their intellect, and yet it's still a journey that requires uh, great effort uh, in multiplied levels from others. And I think uh, it really resonated with with me. And I think about you know the journey that I've had. So thank you, Corey Booker, for sharing uh, the narrative that everyone, I think, should understand as you look at successful African-American women. And could you, uh, I think everyone who watches, listens, knows I have a, a tagline where I said, you, you can't be what you don't see. So I'd love for you to talk about your pathway to this place in your life. Um, what does one do? How does one become the CEO of a magnificent organization? Well, first of all, I say is through a lot of support and mentorship, hard work, and uh, I call it divine intervention. Uh, but my starting point uh, is right in the state of Mississippi. Both my parents were born in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And when you all hear the story of that Northern migration, uh, African-Americans leaving the South, heading North, looking for opportunities, uh, those were my parents. 
and they moved to Detroit where I was born, number nine of 10 children. And many of my older siblings were born in Mississippi. So my home, I'd say, is in Mississippi in the Delta. Um, but I was born in Detroit uh, and you know, my parents were looking for opportunities, not only for themselves, but for their children. And they stressed education. And uh, I was fortunate, I believe, to not only have a great public school system to attend at the time, but uh, older siblings who were mentors and made sure that not only was I successful, that all of the 10 children were successful. And so I grew up wanting to be a CPA. I uh, went to high school knowing that I wanted to become a CPA and I wanted to go to college and major in accounting. I did so in high school as well as in accounting and in college at the University of Michigan, became a CPA. Uh, and then early in my career, I was recruited to work for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Uh, and I knew a little bit about the organization and how they were supporting historically black colleges and uh, trying to promote equality even then. And here I am today, 35 years later, I'll celebrate my 35th anniversary on May 4th. And for the last eight years, I um, have been the president and CEO of the foundation after uh, starting on the finance side and eventually performing almost every function in the organization, including I was the lead uh, programmatic officer for our Mississippi work. So you, you segued right into um, something I want to ask you. I have known about the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and their work even before we started the Mississippi Free Press. You guys have done so much in this community, um, but a lot of folks don't quite know. They see the name and they're not quite sure. Can you talk about why you focus on Mississippi and how it overlaps with other um, priority locations in your uh, reach, in your service area? Sure. And so first, let me say that uh, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation was started by Will Keith Kellogg. We're 92 years old. And when he gave us his wealth, he asked something very simple. He just said, do as you will, so long as it promotes the health, happiness, and well-being of children. And as we have interpreted that request, we know uh, that many children uh, are not thriving. And it's our mission and purpose that all children should thrive. And so our work has been focused on where uh, children were not thriving and where we could make a difference and Mr. Kellogg also said that the way you make a difference for children is that uh, you work in community because people in community know what's best and know how to make the changes necessary for their children to thrive. So at the Kellogg Foundation, uh, our commitment has always been to community, to people and leadership, and also to racial equity, because we know for thrive for children to thrive, they have to have working families. Uh, I know that was how I was able to thrive. My parents left to pursue those opportunities so that they can provide stability for their family. And because they were able to have those opportunities for my parents to work. We knew then that it was because of that community and that environment that allowed that. So our mission can be drilled down to thriving children, working families, and equitable communities, places where people have opportunities, equal opportunities. Could you talk some more um... You know, I think a lot your your mission 
with children, um, then intersex, as you're, you know, alluding to here, really in, intersects with race equity um, or something that um, I learned the, the phrase uh, from my own involvement with, with the Kellogg Foundation, truth, racial healing and transformation um, is very important to your work too. So I would love for you to talk more about that and then how that kind of intersects with your work uh, to help children in their futures, particularly in a state like Mississippi. Yes, and, and to your point, how did we arrive in Mississippi? Yes. Uh, the Kellogg Foundation has been working in Mississippi since the 40s. And when we originally uh, began to make investments in Mississippi, it was related to our integrated farming systems. Uh, we were working in the Delta to support uh, farmers, uh, smallholder farmers to uh, make sure that their systems for food and help uh, were in, would be infused by the best practices. And as we were doing that, we created relationships throughout the Delta and um, understood how community should really lead and drive uh, the work of our foundation. And so in 2008, uh, after many decades already of building relationships, the Kellogg Foundation determined that they would have priority places. And those are places across the United States and in Latin America and the Caribbean where we would concentrate our efforts because we wanted to make long-term sustainable impact. And we decided that the way to do that was to do it alongside community over a long period of time. So we committed ourselves to first the priority place and Mississippi, the state of Mississippi is one of our priority places. And then we said for at least a generation because we know that change happens over time and that people in community must drive and uh, provide the leadership for this change to be sustained. And so our work in Mississippi then uh, was then really focused because we believe the way that you can make the most difference is to be comprehensive in your efforts. We didn't wanna just provide programmatic, spotty programmatic support, but we wanted to connect the dots and if we were working on children, we had to work on their families and their communities, as I said earlier. Uh, and so we're doing that in Sunflower County and in Jackson, really connecting the dots around our work, leveraging partners in the work and making sure that we have a holistic approach and we are not siloed in how we think about the lives of children and their families and how we can really strengthen opportunities. And sometimes that's the policy change. And that leads to your question around our truth, racial healing and transformation effort. We call it the TRHT. But when you really drill down to what is the TRHT, it's about building trusting relationships in communities where people can focus on the systems and structures that are not producing equal outcomes for all children. It's looking at the legacy of racism and the, and the systems that were built uh, to advantage some and disadvantage others. But we don't believe that you can, as a community, dig into the historical legacy of racism unless you've gone through a process of racial healing. We actually say racial healing is at the heart of racial equity. And the healing is the trust building part. And it's bringing people together, creating that safe space for dialogue, for storytelling, allowing them to unpack their commonalities as well. And then once we create that human space where humanity is uplifted and people are affirmed, 
we can begin to figure out how to transform systems so that all people and community can thrive. Uh, we've been uh, supporting this effort for many years now. We just had our sixth annual National Day of Racial Healing. Uh, and this year we had over a million and a half people join this conversation across the nation. Uh, and we're beginning to allow people to truly understand and use this methodology throughout the United States. But I'm really excited that we made a grant very recently uh, right there in Mississippi to begin this work in earnest. And the Mid-South uh, Community Foundation, I want to make sure I get uh, Ivory Allen, Ivy Allen's organization right, but uh, we're going to be working very closely to bring this, this center of racial healing and healing circles to the work in Mississippi and allowing then people and communities to really analyze these systems and transform the systems so that they can uh, produce uh, greater opportunities and uh, the type of thriving children uh, our mission says we should have all over the state and the country. Well, the, uh, I, I think it's the foundation for the Mid-South. With Thank Ivy you. Lai, you know, with you. Ivy Allen, right? Yes. Um, and and I also wanted to follow up with that because it's you know it's really hard to have in today's world uh, to have to be talking about things like the National Day of Racial Healing and not then address what is going on with this kind of create uh, this critical race theory. Uh, movement <laughs> is maybe the nicest thing I could call it. Yeah. But so I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, what your thoughts are on that and, you know, just kind of what is happening and, um, you know, just, just what are your thoughts with you? Well, the Kellogg Foundation made a significant grant in Mississippi to support the building of the two museums. And I believe those museums reflect the type of historical learning and understanding that's at the core of, of racial healing and racial equity. So regardless of what you call it, I call it history. And we've just created truth telling in a space where we've supported children from all over the state to go and learn and understand the history of Mississippi, the issues of Mississippi that we are now trying to address. And, you, and they can see why uh, policies need to change so that all children thrive. Uh, when you look at the legacy of lynching, lynching in Mississippi and you learn about uh, why that is not the history that we want to have for the future of the state. There's no better way to talk about racial equity and to learn about the ills of racism than the structures that you have right there in your state. So, you know, labeling this conversation, uh, I don't get into the labeling, but what I can tell you is that truth telling and knowing our history and affirming humanity through dialogue and continued learning is the foundation of what I think builds the cohesive conversation in a community for the ongoing work of creating better opportunities for all. And yes, uh, it's necessary. It, and as I said, racial healing People think of it as maybe, you know, something that is abstract, but it's actually very concrete and important and essential. And it's about living that truth together across races 
And then once we have affirmed our common humanity, building a future together for all. You know, one of the things you talked about was uh, the two museums and um, W.K. Kellogg Foundation helping those come to fruition. I have so many friends that come from all walks of life, well-read folks who walk, who go in those museums and come out and say, I had no idea, right? And you mentioned the importance of the story, uh, storytelling, uh, contributing to racial reconciliation and healing. Can you talk a little bit about um, why it's important that we have narrative change, including in our media, and what that does to change the course of these, um, what I see now is these generational inequities. Uh, I did a publisher's note a couple of weeks ago that I said, it feels like we're taking four steps forward and two steps back. And I understand sometimes that's the way, but can you say a little more about that? Yes, uh, and at the Kellogg Foundation, when we created our Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation framework, uh, at the core of that framework was racial healing and narrative change. Because when you think about the concept of unconscious bias and where these behaviors are learned, unfortunately, uh, we believe that uh, narrative uh, and storytelling had to be a space where everyone could own their own stories. Too many times uh, people are controlling the story and the narrative uh, and those with power and privilege have the resources to control that narrative even more. Our philosophy was that the narrative belongs to the people. And we wanted to support that truth telling and to work with the mediums where narrative is told. And the media was key for us. It's not the only place we look at, you know, uh, the motion picture industry, uh, many forms of, of communication. But the media for us, we thought, could be a partner because uh, it's grounded in community. And we felt that if we could work together and partner so that storytelling could be owned by many uh, and access to that narrative uh, could be more democratized in a way, we would allow that truth telling to help form the future of how people get to know one another. Uh, some people only know people of color from the media because Unfortunately, we still have and many segregated uh, neighborhoods. And actually, after we talked about racial healing and narrative change, we had three pillars that we were supporting within the truth, racial healing and transformation ever, effort. One was separation. Why are people so separated? How do we build relationships across uh, races and gender. The second pillar was the economy. How are opportunities afforded? Where are those opportunities? And the third pillar was the justice system. Again, was there equality within that space? And all communities were have been dealing with these issues, housing, separation, jobs, workforce, economy, and criminal justice. But we didn't believe that people could just dive right in without reconnecting with one another through the healing process. And again, I think Mississippi has a head up in this space. You all have been, because of the museums, having these conversations. And we really just want to support the continued effort and we do know and we've seen from our other communities that it leads to great policy change and uh, structures that actually uplift all people. You know, it, it, Laduna, it's funny, they uh, flashed up the hierarchy of human value um, on the screen. And the first time I had ever heard that phrase was as, as, a, 
as a W.K. Kellogg fellow. Uh Um, And and what you were saying that they're that we're ahead on a lot of these conversations. And I'll tell my friends that in other parts of the country, you know, that we talk about race and and have have a lot of race dialogues in Mississippi, probably much more so than a lot of people in other states have traditionally done. Now, is there a need for more and more people in those conversations? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it, you know, I just kind of want to testify in a way because, uh, in some ways, being a a, a fellow uh, was continually continual conversation yeah. a, about these kinds of issues and equity and systems, um, and you know, so as a white woman from Mississippi, I get. I just get so frustrated with this idea that people don't even want to have those conversations, you know, or that now with these efforts to kind of shut down these conversations, which seems to be so that we keep the inequities in place, you know, right. that that right. benefit certain people. Um, but, you know, the one thing I will say is that learning uh, and, and especially as a white person to be quiet in that room and to be and to listen a lot, and uh-huh. to be in the minority, as in my case, um, was was a a really powerful, powerful experience, to, and to learn to navigate those things. Uh-huh. And one of the things I've appreciated about uh, the foundation's uh, approach on this is that it, it's not about shutting people out at all. You know, it's about bringing more voices to that table and you mentioned race violence and you probably know I do a lot of uh, writing about that history. We need to know that these horrible things in the past were done very intentionally, right? To to create these inequities today and to divide us. And so as we kind of come, you know, to the end of your part of this show, I think what I would like you to, you know, just, Tell us what you think is needed right now in this moment around for this conversation, I think, to keep moving forward. Yes. Well, thank you, Donna, because we know de- denial was a strategy, right? Uh, denial and separation, those are strategies to keep us in the dark, to not address the truth. And it was interesting because uh, we all, saw the truth when we witnessed the murder of George Floyd. That was a moment where no one could deny what was happening in front of us. And I believe it was a pivotal moment because uh, we did increase awareness and to the point where no one could deny any longer that these atrocities were happening. and. Um, you know, you if you speak with a white person, they would even admit, ah, you know, there's no way they would kill a white man if he were doing the exact same thing. So that the strategy of denial was laid bare and no longer able to to uh, distract us. So I do believe we're in a moment right now while we have the attention, while we have increased awareness, uh, we're at the beginning of a journey. Uh, You heard many people, many companies speak out and call for change. The issue is they don't quite know how to take the journey. And one of the things that we're supporting at the Kellogg Foundation and we is, you know, how to take that journey. Uh, We've taken that journey internally. Uh, When you look at our website, you'll see In my 35 years at the Kellogg Foundation, we've gotten now to the point where uh, people of color are more than 50% of our organization now. Our our board is 60% people of color. So we have taken this journey and we've taken it together. And now that we have the attention and the awareness and the commitment, or at least, a willingness to learn. We've been supporting efforts like the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation effort because we know it's a, a framework that works that brings people together 
and it's not focused on blaming or shaming. At this point, uh, that's not the approach. The approach is truth telling, trust building, relationship building, and working together to create uh, a new reality that isn't built on a hierarchy of human value. It's built on a respect for all humanity. Uh, another thing that we're doing is we're working with companies because uh, we saw that they were ready to take this journey. We have an entire effort called Expanding Equity, where we're bringing some of the companies that made creative and in, uh, bold statements about the need for change, we're actually walking them through some of the work that we've done internally, work that's uh, based on research by McKinsey and company that shows them uh, within their own company how to assess their environment, how to determine if they have what we call a leaky bucket, which means you may recruit people of color but they don't tend to last until the C-suite. They leak out. And the question is, how can you create a better environment for belonging and equality? Uh, and we thought we would you know, test this on a few companies. Our first cohort was about six financial service uh, companies in the financial service industry. Uh, today, we have more than 60 companies and growing. Uh, because there is a, a palpable will right now, and I think it's our moment to really lean in. And those people have been doing this work for decades to take the leadership to help others take the journey. Well, that's that's an amazing program, and uh, and needed work. And uh, you know, it's it's just you know, I we appreciate you. <laughs> we appreciate what the foundation does for Mississippi, the jobs that you've helped create, the, uh, you know, the conversations that you've helped facilitate. Me personally, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, your work has had a profound impact on me and people around me and how we approach things. So, uh, so I thank you so much, Lejeune. Um, I, I think on behalf of Mississippi, you know, to, for, for just, you know, being this tenacious about the work and about our state and believing, because, you know, investing in Mississippi also means believing that we can solve things and that we can, we can lift up all our people and that we can kind of be, you know, better than our past. So and um, that's, that's why I was going to thank you, Donna, and thank you, Kimberly, because uh, we do believe that people have the inherent capacity to improve their own lives. And uh, our work is only done through people and leadership. And the two of you demonstrate the type of leadership and partnerships that we look for in every community. So thank you, because at the end of the day, it's your work that make, makes this happen for children. Well, we, we, to we so appreciate that, Lejeune. And I think on behalf of Kimberly and our readership, you know, we really appreciate you taking this time out tonight um, to give us, uh, you know, just to inspire us, basically. Thank and you. So thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate all of you and you are. Uh, I just thank you. And I'm looking forward to our work in the future. Okay, so now our next guest is... Uh, another power woman at the, at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, uh, who is actually based here in Jackson, where, um, where Kimberly and I are. Rhea Williams Bishop is the Director of Programming for Mississippi and New Orleans for the foundation and uh, a lifelong Mississippian and, it, it, and is here to tell us her story. Hey, Rhea. Hey, Donna. Hey, Kimberly. Thank you all so much for, for having us both. Uh, just listening to Lejeune just, you know, uh, makes me feel uh, even prouder to be doing what we're doing here in Mississippi and in New Orleans, of course, with the help and backing of, of our leadership and colleagues at the Kellogg Foundation. We are really, really excited to have you here. And um, 
I miss seeing you around town, but hopefully we can change that very soon. <laughs> now that we're so. getting out a little more. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Well, one of the things um, I wanted to ask you about, because I don't know, it feels like I should know. Um, how can you tell our audience a little bit about your journey um, to this place uh, at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and how you ended up here and what motivated you and what your passions were, what inspired you to come here? I surely can. I think, Kimberly, I, I will start from early on. Um, I'm a fifth generation Mississippian, born in Greenville, Mississippi, right, you know, right during the middle of the civil rights movement. But I grew up in uh, Carthage, Lee County, Harmony Community, on the banks of the Pearl River on a cattle and tim timber farm. And um, I share that And Lee County is right next door to Neshoba County. So Donna and I constantly tease each other about being homegirls because literally we grew up maybe 15, 20 miles apart. Uh, you know, growing up in that small, tight knit community, um, we had more than most. Our parents were teachers in the public school system and had several businesses. My grandparents owned the farmland that we lived on and operated a small community store. And that store, I think, uh, influenced me. It was the go-to place in the community and the center of the action, of course, along with our church and the baseball field and other activities. But it's where I got my earliest lessons in philanthropy. And philanthropy is the love of humanity. At that time, I didn't know what philanthropy meant or that there could be a career in philanthropy. And, you know, some of the best lessons I had in life came from sitting on the store porch, listening to the the elders uh, pontificate. And also as the great niece of the late great Winston Hudson, most of the young people that grew up in our community had no choice but to be socially and civically active, uh, participating in everything from singing in the choir to uh, the junior NAACP chapter. And that's really where I had my first hand look at servant leadership. So fast forward on to JSU, very active on campus, uh, very supportive of JSU, even still today, where I give my time, talent, and treasure, a three-time graduate. And attending that HBCU allowed me four years where I really didn't have to worry about racism, uh, you know, and allowed me to concentrate on learning about myself, focusing on my culture, history, and at the same time, building confidence, both academically and socially, and that's very important. Um, graduated, got married, made a conscious decision to stay in Mississippi, and unlike Lejeune, she knew she wanted to be a CPA. I had no real idea of what I wanted to do exactly. I knew I wanted to help people, uh, help promote Mississippi and change Mississippi for the better, and so it wasn't a straight line for me. It was more like a winding dirt road like I grew up on. And I was really proud that my first job was working at the Dr. A.H. McCoy Federal Building downtown. Stayed there for five years as a management analyst and just knew I wanted to do more. So I took a career step backwards to start working at a small nonprofit, working on children's issues, everything from the children's health insurance program to communities and schools. And I ended up uh, at my happy place at Children's Defense Fund, Southern Regional Office, where I worked there for 15 years and then six years at uh, the Center, Mississippi Center for Education Innovation, where uh, I served as director. And all of throughout my career, I was funded by the Kellogg Foundation, except uh, while I was at Internal Revenue Service. And after seven years, after six years at the center, then the Kellogg Foundation reached out and um, I became director and have been in this role for nearly seven years now. Um, I always like to hear these stories because I have young people that come to me uh, almost in knots about what they're going to major in. <laughs> and, I was, and I always tell them, it'll be fine. It will be fine. Just fix 
figure out something. I have mm -hmm. nursing friends that major in art. Just go. It's going to be fine. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little more about, we, we touched on it before with Lejeune, but can you really uh, talk to us about some of the programming you have been involved in during your time at the WTA Kellogg Foundation? Certainly, certainly, Kimberly. So she mentioned um, the investments at the uh, two museums. It's a wonderful program. That was one, when I came through the door, that was one of the biggest investments we were making as I was coming in. And to give you a little bit of an idea about our grant making, she, Lejeune mentioned that we started investing in Mississippi around 1940. So that's been about six decades of consistent, ongoing investments. And to give you an idea about the amount of money. So in 2021, we committed about $53 million to Mississippi. 22 million is like our regular grant making. The range will be anywhere from 20 to 25 on an annual basis. But this year, our trustees decided to, due to COVID and, and the situation uh, involving uh, COVID, to invest what we call social bonds in $30 million in addition to that, that 22 million. So we are very uh, proud of that fact. And the team worked really hard to make that happen. Uh, some other some examples of the social bond investments that we made. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, Donna. We are investing in in state media um, through a grant to the Community Foundation of Mississippi, and we want to make sure and in, uh, that our communities have access to factual information that will preserve democracy. This grant helps to build capacity of local newsrooms, including training on. Uh, data mining and implicit bias. We're also doing funding and, and investments in employment equity. We have a program uh, that we funded in this past year at Delta State University uh, to launch the very first minority women's business center in the state um, to build wealth and economic stability for women of color by providing the type of uh, TA and resources they need for business planning, technical assistance, access to capital and financial literacy training. We're also in conversations with Jackson State University about uh, helping support some of their work in the same area. In terms of health equity, we funded Mission Mississippi, um, the Southern area of the Lynx Incorporated. And here in Mississippi, that includes both the Lafleur's Bluff chapter and the Jackson chapter. And this funding is to address COVID-19, uh, the vaccine equity issues in Mississippi by working with faith-based leaders and community-based organizations across the state in communities uh, to make sure that we do everything we can to, to fight this virus. And I'm sure that uh, some of your readers and listeners have uh, heard the ads on the radio that are linked to this work. And we're really, we're really proud of the work that, that these groups are doing. In early childhood education, uh, we're funding the Mississippi Children's Museum, and they are promoting effective early literacy opportunities based in neuroscience and research uh, for children and for caregivers by launching the Talk from the Start program. It's a mobile exhibit uh, that includes educational programming that we think will really help us push early childhood education. Um, we're very strategic in our funding uh, priorities. Um, I think the best examples of our work combine what the foundation can provide in terms of dollars, uh, along with working with govern the government at all levels to maximize our investments and ensure positive change for children. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that when we fund, there, um, there's leverage there. So we talked about the two museums. Our funding was some of the initial funding, but it catapulted and it grew, it snowballed. We ended up with funding from the state of Mississippi, which makes that museum the only civil rights museum in the nation with state funding. And so we're proud of that fact as a moderator, as a convener, bringing people together uh, in that work. Uh, the Pre-K Collaborative, the support and expansion of that work 
uh, working in conjunction with folks like the Mississippi Economic Council, uh, who's, who have been supportive of that work for a number of years. Who can forget the Better Together Commission? <laughs> uh, bringing, <laughs> I hear you laugh, Donna, because you know how, how tough that work was. <laughs> tough but rewarding work. Bringing the city of, of, Jack, uh, of Jackson together with the state of Mississippi, uh, the foundation, parents, families, communities, all partners involved in education to make sure that we came together to basically save the school district. And um, we're, that investment is still paying dividends right today. Um, compete to complete uh, the Mississippi Integrated Basic Education and Skills Training. I could go on and on because there are so many um, investments that we, we've made, particularly on my best we were able to invest $6 million and the Mississippi Community College Board matched that $6 million with an additional $6 million. And so through that program, we have thousands of, of young adults, young people who have completed th those programs and have certifications and trainings that can lead them on the pathways to jobs with living wages so they can take care of themselves and their families. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Donna, but one of the things that struck me as you were talking mm -hmm. is how a crisis increases um, the, and I lost my word, the, dis, the uh, increases disparities. Like you can see the cracks even more, which is exactly. what COVID did, right? Which exactly. Because we've been convening these um, Black women in COVID circles with women, uh, Black women from around the state. And mm -hmm. um, the things that were an issue are now magnified from healthcare to exactly. broadband to public education. And I don't think people realize how important it is to help fill those gaps when you're in the middle of a crisis, in addition to, right. a, excuse me, extending that beyond the crisis, which is what you're talking about, that generational work mm -hmm. you do. Mm -hmm. And that's a perfect uh, point to make, Kimberly. That's one of the reasons our trustees decided to, uh, you know, uh, partner and and extend the amount of funding that we were given at this particular time. They saw the need and took immediate action with the social bond funding. We um, relaxed some of our requirements on grantees to make it easier to access the dollars because we know how critical those dollars were uh, during that time when things were shut down. You know, schools being shut down. We worked to work with the school district. Uh, in Jackson to make sure students had access to the internet. And the only way we could do that was to pool funds and work together with others to make sure that those students' mm -hmm. needs were met uh, at that critical time. Small businesses, we, we know small businesses were, were crushed during that time of the shutdown. Um, you know, we made funds available through our grantees so that it would ease some of the strain. And um, really glad that we were able to step in that gap and fill those, help fill those needs. Um, Rhea, you uh, you submitted a column to us recently um, where you talked about farm to early care mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. right? And you know what what struck me about uh, that column is something that you know we we are obviously in sync on this idea yeah. that we have to look very carefully at systems um, and systems that create the inequities of today, mm -hmm. right? Because if we don't, then they get embedded and then they just continue for generations and generations. But you, but one of the things that you, um, that you kind of address in this column uh, is this idea that while you guys are, really focused on early childhood education and, and like, and trying to, you know, help young people early so that generationally they are more successful and they are mm -hmm. more healthy and all of those things. And one of the things that you said in the, in this column was nutritious food helps prepare little ones to be good thinkers when they get to school. Right. And that seems like such a simple statement, but it, there, it's so profound because, and it, and then you follow up here and say, children who eat 
homegrown fruits and vegetables are more than twice as likely to get the USDA recommended five servings day, daily yeah. later in life. This means healthier children, healthier adults. You know, if we play it out, it can mean safer communities. Mm -hmm. It can mean mm -hmm. less violence. I think of the reporting that Coyote Crown has been doing on uh, on lead in, in, exactly. in children that then leads to violence and leads to all kind of misbehavior and leads to unhealthy. So my whole point there is to say it's this idea of connecting those dots and going backward um, and that health is so much a part of just a young person's ability to be able to be successful. So I just, I wanted you to just Donna, talk more yeah, about that. You, you are so right. You're dead on. Um, we can't implement, yeah, we, our purpose is for children to thrive. Mm -hmm. Children cannot thrive if they are not healthy and whole. And we have to look at, you, you think this is basic. The fact that we have so many food deserts that access to healthy, fresh fruits and vegetables is a struggle for many people. We can, you know, we can take, we can look at uh, the community of Drew. People were having, would have to drive 30 to 40 miles for fresh fruits and vegetables. And the commitment of grantees there to, uh, ha, that has worked and we've helped support that community. And now they have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. This is something that should be a no brainer. And the fact that I grew up on a farm, uh, I'm the beneficiary of having access to uh, nutritious food, uh, access to adequate and proper health care. And so all those things lead to school success and lead to young people and children being able to become successful contributing adults. And so until we get those basics right, it's really hard to move on to, to other things. Those should be just, those are just basic rights. And I often tell, tell people what I want for my own children or want is what I want for all of Mississippi's children whether it's access to healthy uh, foods, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, access to a high quality early education, access to quality health care, um, all of those things. And that's what we should want for all of our children. And you know, when we look at it, human, what can be more important than human development? Mm -hmm. What we do for children to make sure that they are thriving um, as they become adults. Well, and, and when Lejeune was talking, um, you know, talking about that connection between like the TRHT and the, the racial uh, equity healing, you know, bet between that and the needs of children so that we can, you know, we reverse these cycles essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about that because, you know, so much. And then you talked about history, right? And the Civil Rights Museum, it all connects mm -hmm. up because if people don't understand the history and the reasons, the causes exactly. of these inequities, then it becomes very easy to just blame groups of people mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. as Black people, right? Or culture or whatever the case might be. And so which seems to be, you know, from where I'm sitting anyway, kind of seems part of the point of this, the anti-CRT stuff is to keep us from understanding these things, right? And so that we we solve them. And, and I don't know, that's, you know, obviously that's very disturbing, but um, so I don't know, just if you have a, just kind of a final comment that ties in the, the work about race and why, uh, TRHT approaches are so important to this work overall. I would love. Yeah, that. you know, narrative change and healing are critical uh, in what it is that we're trying to do. Um, without those, if if we can't get to the truth, we can't change the narrative. Then there's not much we can do. You know, if you think about what we see, and Lejeune talked about this on the news, our favorite TV shows, all those things shape what we think and it forms unconscious perceptions of people and who, you know, who they are, what they're capable of um, and how we interact with them. 
So think about our children of color. What narrative has been shaped about them that impacts how maybe a teacher or a coach or a principal might, may or may not support them? I've experienced that with my own children. Narratives of people are formed everywhere. The media is just one place, uh, albeit a very influential place, but narratives also are created in you know, what's included in the school curricula, what history is taught in the museums, what monuments we display, all those things play a very, very important role in that. And you know, recently I uh, did an article on social studies. Um, and you know, I share this because I felt that we needed to speak the truth on the topic. And folks need to actually see themselves and their experiences in our history. Um, we have to be able to share uh, the cultural experiences, you know, with, without their voices being suppressed or their truths being ignored or dismissed. And you know, school is a meaningful place for that to happen. It can happen in other places, but what better place than the school? And I use an example of, uh, of my father uh, during the 70s, teaching and requiring his students to uh, study black history during the month of February. That was before it became, uh, you know, uh, cool to do so, before it was acceptable. And I recall, parents lined up at the principal's office to say, uh, we will not allow uh, this to happen. We don't want this to happen. And my father simply said, they can either study what I'm teaching or get a zero. And all of us, many of us that came through his class in middle school had a great appreciate, leaders all across the country doing great things. He gets stopped all the time about how appreciative they are that he um, was courageous enough to step out and do what had to be done because that history is American history. And we want to make sure that um, the, all sides are told. That's the only way we can get to healing. That's the only way that we will become a better state, a thriving state that uh, doesn't experience massive brain drain uh, that respects all cultures. And that will lead to, I think, a, an even better uh, country if, if we take that approach. Hmm. Well, amen. <laughs> and I will say, I mean, yeah. I get, you know, I'm thankful every day that I can, uh, that I can read and that I can yes. understand and I can seek new information. Uh, that opens up so much of a wider world and people to me. And, yeah. uh, and I, that's, you know, our young people deserve that opportunity. They, they deserve the truth they and they can handle the truth. I mean, we don't can. have to, we don't have to, to insult our kids in the process of doing all this. So ah, thank you so much, Rhea, <laughs> for these wonderful comments for, you know, sharing uh, the work of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation um, in Mississippi. I, I think people know you guys are out there, but they don't always kind of understand, uh, you know, the depth, I think, of the work that the foundation is doing. And so we really appreciate both you as well as President and CEO Lejeune Montgomery Taborin for coming on for the first hour, half hour of the show tonight. Um, we do encourage uh, everybody watching this out there to please share the show mm -hmm. um, because you can see it on YouTube later. You can see it on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, so share it around, you know, if, if maybe, maybe the program can some, can create some more conversation, you know, out there in the, in the state. So we, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you guys taking your time to do this uh, You're very tonight. Welcome. And we I'm appreciate you all. Thank you. Well, we're in the, I'm in the, I'm in the presence of lots of power women tonight. So you too, Kimberly. So thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. And to the rest of you out there, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. We're going to have, we have another speaking of history and speaking of knowledge. Mm -hmm. We have a great MFP live program for you next week. Uh, Roscoe Barnes, 
uh, is going to join us. Uh, Roscoe, if you don't know who he is, uh, you know, saying he's with Visit Natchez and some of the, 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 it just doesn't even capture it. Roscoe is a real historian uh, of, of Black history in the state of Mississippi. I first ran into his work online when I was uh, down in Wilkins, Wilkinson County trying to learn more about Ann Moody. Uh, he is just, uh, he's just a font of information. And now he's working in Natchez and he's really uh, opening up uh, what's going on in that city facing its own uh, race and black history. And so we're really tickled to talk to, to Roscoe next week. And we know that that's going to be a great show. And I always have to, uh, so I don't get in trouble with Kimberly. I always have to mention, please, if you can support our nonprofit uh, journalism, uh, you can visit mfp.ms slash donate and give whatever you can give. Uh, our, uh, our individual donors are a huge part of what we're able to do across Mississippi as well as across the United States. And so we, we appreciate all of you so much. Uh, we also have, last announcement, we have our third uh, Preventing Violence Solution Circle that is virtual coming up on the 29th. Um, and this has been a wonderful conversation with people from all across the state. So I hope that uh, if you guys can join us and help us keep brainstorming uh, potential solutions for violence, which goes far beyond policing, as you might guess, uh, you can write uh, this number here, or you can, I believe it's at uh, mfp uh, mfp.ms slash solutions um, or circles, one or the other. So you can, you can register to join the circle then. So got a lot going on, but uh, we really, really, really in, enjoyed this show. So thank you so much, Rhea. And we'll see you out and about in Jackson, hopefully, here soon. And thank you, Kimberly, for being a fabulous hostess as always. See y'all soon.